So there's so much in there to unpack. It's hard to know where to even start. But perhaps, perhaps I'd probably quite like to start with the glucose connection with cancer because, I mean, you know, again, we talked a little bit earlier about what cancer patients are fed. There's no guidelines coming from the top down about it is diet. Sad. Um, people sad. say to me, oh, you know, I was told, no, it's got nothing to do with my diet. Um, do you want to just unpack that a yeah, little bit? Yeah, so diet and the gut really go hand in hand. Um, so the gut microbiome is critical because it does affect uh, mitochondria, it affects a variety of cells, it's been indicated in a variety of um, cancers. But diet is so critical because glucose is um, creates problems with insulin, as you know, it creates fat deposits and it just screws up the um, microbiome and the epithelial barrier. Glucose is the food for cancer cells. It eats much, much more glucose than other cells because it's inefficient in um, its production of uh, energy through the means of glycolysis through with glucose, it needs lots and lots and lots of molecules of glucose, but it also eats um, glutamate, which is amino an amino acid. So it does feed on both of those. Glutamate is an important amino acid. You just can't eliminate it. It'll, it'll kill you, actually, if you destroy your glutamate or glut um, glutamine. But um, what is you can do... Is, sorry, is that why you do the two to one ratio fat to protein? Is that why yeah, so it is to control because, the glutamate? No, it's actually to 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 create ketones oh, that yeah. will be fed feed all the cells but but right. the cancer cells. So the glutamate is still going to be there for the cancer cells in some capacity, but they're not going to get the glucose because the glucose is not yeah. readily available. So that's the fat portion of the diet creating ketones instead of glucose. And I suppose if you're, key, if you're keeping the protein down, you haven't got quite as much gluconeogenesis going on as well. Yeah, so yeah, but gluconeogenesis is going to occur in its normal biological sense because there are certain yeah. cells that need the glucose and the body knows that and knows how to create that. So it's not a problem. It's right. definitely not a problem. And uh, ketone bodies probably have been the way our primal ancestors really have survived. There are studies, um, archaeological and anthropolo um, anthropolo anthropological studies that have shown uh, skeletal remains and, and the surroundings of these buried bones that, that they can identify and do nitrogen testing to determine the kinds of proteins they were eating. They can identify that these um, primal humans actually were more animal-based than plant-based. And we have, interestingly, a digestive system that has evolved for at least 160,000 years, let alone two and a half million years, but Homo sapiens may be 160,000 years, that is more um, designed to digest animal food. For example, our stomach has an acid of 1 to 1.3 as a pH, but herbivores and other omnivores, but mainly herbivores, plant animal, plant eating animals, have a stomach acid significantly higher than that, uh, pH higher than that, meaning less acid, because they don't have to kill off microbes that are uh, just, um, f fermenting and damaging and rotting the muscle meat. So our, our stomachs are designed to kill microbes more so because of the f animal products that we're eating than herbivores that are not eating those kind of foods. Also, we have a very long intestine, uh, small intestine, that is ideal to digest and absorb the protein material. And, we ha and herbivores have a, a short um, small intestine. Herbivores have a very long colon and a cecum that takes its time to digest plant food. We have a very, very short um, uh, large intestine and almost no cecum that is not really designed for plant food digestion. So our guts literally are more designed for animals than plants, but we can digest plants, obviously, but our bodies kind of like the, the animals. The other thing that's interesting is that plants have anti-nutrients. Now you can cook away some of these anti-nutrients like phytates and 
lectins and oxalates and prepare them in certain ways so you can minimize them. But these proteins are damaging to a variety of par parts of the body. They bind to minerals when you're eating them so they don't get absorbed. They, they destroy and damage the microbiome. They definitely can destroy the epithelial barrier, putting holes in them, creating a leaky gut. So animals have a digestive system to destroy these anti-nutrients much more efficiently and absorb the real nutrients of the, the plants into their animal products, the meat and the organs and the fat and the collagen. So when we eat those animals that are sourced naturally and eating their natural diet, we get all these vitamins and minerals in a biologically active form with no, none of the anti-nutrients. They're very easily absorbed by our body. So we get vitamin C in animals, mainly in the organ meats, especially liver. And that vitamin C is more heat stable than vitamin C from plants. It's a little different chemical structure. And when we're not eating so much glucose, actually vitamin C competes with glucose to get into the cells. So that's why you have to have so much more vitamin C just to force itself into the cells. Whereas if you don't have all this glucose in your, in your diet, carb, refined carbohydrates, then the vitamin C from animal products easily get into the cell. So you don't need as much vitamin C to have the effect. And it's a different type of vitamin C for your cells. This is stuff that has actually been reported and published. And it's very interesting. It's not necessarily well known, but it's very interesting. So eating an animal-based diet makes a lot of sense. Now, a lot of people say, well, you're not going to have any fiber. Therefore, you're not going to feed your gut microbiome and you're going to have constipation. Well, that's totally incorrect. There was a paper that was published less than a year ago that explained in detail how the gut microbiome, this is interesting, how the gut microbiome, when it's necessary, ferments amino acids to get the same short-chain fatty acids that are required that it would get from fiber. So the, the microbiome is very adaptive. It will ferment fiber when it's there and it will ferment amino acids when it's there. So you don't have to have the fiber. And actually the motility of the gut is not always a result of the fiber that we eat. Actually the fiber can actually create swelling in the gut um, and inflammation in the gut lining. The mast cells that are lining the epithelial barrier, not the ones that are in the circulation, but in the barrier have a lot to do with stimulating motility in the gut. So a person like me, I have no problem with bowel movements and I am on a strict carnivore diet. Um, so I'm doing well. I, I, you know, I think that diet is great. Now I do that. Now the other thing that I do is with the gut microbiome because the microbiome has a lot to do with cancer. So when, when we're talking about metabolic dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction and glucose, if I have a diet that is minimally um, giving me exogenous glucose, then I have a cleaner diet that's not feeding cancer cells. And um, it's, in, in, it's enhancing my immune system and my gut microbiome to function more effectively. Mm. I think this is why it's working for cancer patients. And I think it's, that's why it's working for me. So what would your recommendation to cancer patients be that they really, I, well, definitely processed foods, I imagine, you know, get, stop eating those chalky biscuits and drinking that Coke when you're in at the cancer clinic. Well, without a doubt, uh, I, I told you in the beginning, when I go to my cancer clinic, which I do every month, the nurses in the infusion clinic are always handing out, yesterday, for example, sweet candies and or chocolate chip cookies with a soda. And these are patients that are on chemotherapy infusions, sitting there with their uh, um, infusions dripping into their body, eating chocolate chip cookies. It makes no sense. When I was diagnosed with cancer, I, I was required to have a con consultation with the cancer clinic's dietitian. And that was going to be interesting. I really wanted to know what they had to say. And I went into the meeting with my wife and uh, the dietitian was basically telling me the most important thing for cancer patients is not to lose weight. So just eat anything that has calories. I said, anything that has calories? 
you know what I mean? Like pizza and sandwiches and just, yeah, anything that you like that's going to give you calories, that's okay, as long as you like it. I said, you don't know who I am, but I do a little bit of research in the gut microbiome and nutrition and healthy diets. And this is an antithesis of what a cancer patient should be eating. They should not be eating high carbohydrates or sugar or even processed seed oils. Um, we have had, and she and I had a little bit of a, an argument, unfortunately, um, at that point. <laughs> and my wife is cringing because she doesn't like when I make a uh, scene, which I always do. And I, I left. She was not, the dietitian was not happy with me and I wasn't happy with her. And she was a, a very nice lady. It's just that this is information she's giving to every patient who is there in a life death situation. Every cancer patient is a life death situation. They're on drugs that would kill anybody else. You know why cancer patients have to have a port to, to get these infusions of chemotherapy. The chemists, the chemics, the chemicals in chemotherapy are so caustic that if they just use an IV infusion, like a vein in your arm and they put a little needle in there and they dripped the chemotherapy drugs into that and it dripped outside of the vein, it would necrose all the tissue. It would literally melt it away. It would be like acid burning your skin. Mm. This is what's going into your body. This is killing every cancer cell, theoretically, and all other cells that it comes in contact with that have um, a quick mitosis um, process. They, they duplicate quickly. And this then has to be regenerated. And then the side effects of all, the, of all these chemicals chemotherapy drugs, sometimes the side effects are more debilitating than the cancer. You know, patients that have chemotherapy and or radiation frequently get what's called mucositis. And that's all the mucous membranes of the tissue of the body have these ulcers and sores. And it comes in the mouth like what's called oral mucositis. It's just raw, red, bleeding, tender uh, uh, lesions in the mouth. You, it's hard to swallow. It's hard to speak. It's almost impossible to eat anything. It, it's very, very uncomfortable. It takes maybe certainly weeks, maybe months to clear up. And it's very debilitating. This is a side effect, they say. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. And then they put you on corticosteroid drugs to co correct that. And that's, corticosteroids are a problem in and of itself. Um, here's a sidebar here, but uh, if you had that problem, Manuka honey is a phenomenal healer for oral mucositis. And there are double blind studies that show Manuka honey or other raw honey actually is as good, if not better than corticosteroids for mucositis. And there are dozens of double blind studies that prove that. You won't hear that from a cancer clinic because they don't know anything about it, but it's true. And we have great manuka honey in New Zealand. <laughs> I know that. Uh, I know that. As a matter of fact, I get some from you guys. Yeah. I love it. And I'll talk to you about more about manuka honey um, shortly because you've got a bit of a um, teeth cleaning protocol with manuka honey too, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And there are yes. And this is not conjecture or anecdotal stories. This is published double-blind studies. Very interesting stuff. Mm. Okay, so so we want to get rid of all the processed food, all this yes. exogenous glucose, but lots of people go on these raw food, vegetable, fruit diets as well. Um, and, that, and they're not really understanding that that's contributing the glucose, but also those oxalates and all those other anti-nutrients that are yes, upsetting that's the, true. the gut. But you, but you know... If you're on a standard American diet or a, sta a Western diet, I'm not sure how you call it in New Zealand when you're eating lots of uh, processed carbs and lots of sugar. Quick but diet. Whatever, yeah. So if you, most people are on that diet, and if they became a vegan or a vegetarian, it's so much healthier than that diet. Yeah. But it's not a healthy diet. And I know you'll get a lot of calls about that. But it's not a healthy diet, it's just sad. Here's, here's something that I tell everybody that asks me the question. You didn't ask me the question, so I'm just gonna tell you anyhow. <laughs> everybody, ha everybody is who they are because of their DNA blueprint. 
And we are individuals only because of their certain variations in that DNA blueprint. But most of the DNA blueprint is the same for everybody. And that DNA blueprint at, that has evolved at least for 160,000 years knows exactly what it needs to survive. It needs water. You have to drink. It needs oxygen. You have to breathe oxygen. You can't be in a nitrogen controlled environment and survive. You need oxygen, whatever the percentage of it is. You need it. End of story. You can't substitute it. You can't do a little bit less. You need the amount of oxygen you need. And you need certain nutrients, period. You need those nutrients. It has to be in the food that you eat or you're going to die. Also, it knows what it can tolerate certain toxic elements that it does not have the capacity to create enzymes to destroy those, whatever you want to call it, toxic elements. So you must eat the foods that give it the nutrients that it needs, and you must avoid the foods and or chemicals that destroy it because it does not know how to detoxify or destroy those toxins. It knows how to do a lot with toxins, but certain ones it doesn't. It does not know how to deal with gluten. None of our DNA enzymes have been evolved enough to break down gluten to basic amino acids. It breaks down gluten to clumps of amino acids called peptides, but it has no method to strip them down to the basic amino acid. And because of that, those peptides, one of which is called gliadin, has been shown numerous times by various researchers, especially um, Alessio Fasano, Alessio Fasano, yep. um, did the, the groundbreaking research that showed these peptides cause a chemical in the epithelial barrier called zonulin to overstimulate and create holes in the gut lining that stay wide open, too wide, where these peptides start to flow into the bloodstream. Now, these openings occur in small, minute amounts in, to allow regular nutrients that are fully digested to get into the bloodstream. But when they're overstimulating, the holes get too big for too long, other junk that's not going to ever go through the epithelial barrier now get through because the holes are there. And li lipopolysaccharides, LPS, from dying um, gram-negative bacteria cell walls, which are strongly toxic to the body, get into the bloodstream, and it creates metabolic endotoxemia. That's where the systemic inflammation starts and spreads throughout the body, and every organ system is involved. The body cannot tolerate or digest gluten, period. Some people better than others, but no one can digest it completely. The beautiful thing is the epithelial barrier is the most um, reproducible re re reparative organ system in the body. It replaces itself, every cell in the epithelial barrier replaces itself every three to maybe five to seven days. So in one week, you have a new epithelial barrier. So if you were to eat junk, lots of junk, and then stop, you would have a reaction, you would have an acute systemic reaction, pro acute inflammatory reaction, that your immune system would go crazy, your gut bacteria would be going crazy, it would heal and replace, and in one week you would have a new barrier if you didn't continue to eat that junk. In other words, if you change your diet and avoid the chemicals that are toxic, it's only gonna take a week for you to clean it up and have no unhealthy barrier. Now, if you've been eating junk for a while and your immune system has gotten activated and your adaptive system is creating antibodies and it's floating in your blood, it'll always be there. So you'll have that reaction if anything leaks into your blood again. But if you have a healthy diet now and you have an intact epithelial barrier, what's in the lumen stays in the lumen and it then gets out of your body through uh, when you go to the bathroom. So the beauty is we can repair our guts very, very nicely. But if you constantly put toxic stu substances in your body that your DNA is unable to get rid of, you are doing a disservice. That's why you should not eat 
gluten foods. You should not be eating um, processed sugars. The sugar in an apple is not the sugar that you sprinkle on a strawberry. It's a different sugar. So yeah, if you eat too many fruits, you're going to have too much glucose in your blood. But of one fruit is not a problem, but a, te a teaspoon of processed sugar is a problem. And, and the problem is you do it all the time or a person does it all the time. So you got to get rid of that and you got to get rid of the processed seed oils like the canola oil and the safflower oil and, and soybean oil and all these because they're very inflammatory. They oxidize very quickly. They become rancid and their chemical process is, is unhealthy to start with. Even if it's not chemically induced, it's cold press and it sounds like it's organic and everything is beautiful, they still are highly inflammatory because of the omega-6 uh, fatty acids that are in too much of an abundance. So it only makes sense to get rid of the bad foods. If you want diets that, that are designed to help you get rid of them, the paleo diet would be one, the ketogenic diet is one, Certainly the carnivore diet is one. The Mediterranean diet I have some issues with because they do use whole grains. Um, they use legumes that has lots of anti-nutrients, but of course they cook them so much to, to break them down and that probably works, but there are still residual lectins and oxalates that are in there. It, don't make life so difficult. Just do something that avoids the bad foods that your body really never was designed to digest and enjoy everything else. And there's lots and lots to enjoy.